Hey guys, Bigfooter Gary. I spent uh, an hour and a half back in the hunting blind earlier tonight and we did a live show in which I read a story for you guys that was sent to me out of Quebec. Well, unfortunately, I was on the wrong channel. I was on Unfrequented World. So I'm gonna copy that story now, post it to this channel. You guys can always check out Gary Reed on Frequented World, which is my other channel, and Metal Detecting Lost Treasures, which is my metal detecting channel, okay? Because sometimes I do screw up and you will get videos on the other channel that were supposed to be here. In this case, the story is interesting enough and I could salvage the recording that I'm going to put it here to share on this channel where it was originally supposed to go. So it's not live now, but it was last night. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you in the next adventure. mentioned earlier for those that just showed up we have a story out of Quebec I'm gonna share it with you guys we'll do it live yes Claudia this is in Canada I will periodically look up okay and try to see you guys messages I can't do both obviously at the same time so Victor got a notification yeah so now that I'm not waving the camera around hopefully it's not gonna break up on you guys Okay, so let's do this live story and we'll just see if I hear anything, I'll stop. I'll let you guys know we're recording on the other camera. So we'll have evidence that we can put in the next video. And hopefully the tent doesn't blow away on me while I'm doing this. Bonjour mon ami du Nord. I really enjoy your channel and am also a fellow Canadian. I hail, oh there goes the tent. <laughs> I hail from Northern Quebec. And let me tell you, if you think you have a Bigfoot problem in Ontario, then you need to come to visit my friend. I have a story for you to share on the channel and a few other strange incidents to talk about. My English is pretty good, but not when it comes to the writing. My wife Elaine is going to fix all of my mistakes so you will understand. My wife and I own a large hunt camp a few hundred kilometers north of Montreal. We hunt there every season and there can be as many as 18 of us there for moose season. We have had many strange incidents occur at the camp over 20 years. Everything from large footprints being found by hunters to tree knocking and all kinds of structures. One season, we even had a guy shoot a cow and calf moose, and when the hunter and his guide finished the field dressing of the animal, they came back to camp, a one hour ride by quad. They came to get a trailer and some help. The guide had over 10 years experience and knew the land as well as my wife and I. When they returned to the stands to get the moose, the cow was still there, but the calf was gone. Of course, we all assumed it was a bear dragging the calf away, but we did not find bear prints. We found large human-like footprints in the mud, down and along the banks of the river. We never did get the calf back, but we also did not look too hard, if you know what I mean. We loaded the cow and got out of there as darkness fell. All of us agreed we had an uneasy feeling of something watching us. A feeling of, you are not welcome here. So we finished our work on the cow and left as fast as we could. This is dangerous, Gary reading live, because when I do this for you guys and it's not live, I can go back and I can reread the same thing six times until I get it right. So you'll have to bear with me, guys. We have also seen the strange orange lights move through the thick forest up here, small in size, maybe four to 10 inches around. And that's exactly what we saw down here, guys, in the swamp the other night. I would say it was five or six inches around, okay? It wasn't orange, it was a, like a whitish blue and it was fading in and out. I even got that on the recording. You guys seen it fade out and then it came back. And I, I watched it for three or four minutes the other night. I had a real hard time finding it on the camcorder, like zoomed out all the way. So maybe a couple hundred yards away from, from the hunting blind. I had a couple guys ask me about those details. I, in the heat of the moment, I forgot to share where it was, how far it was and what I was seeing. But that's, you know, this big around, not huge. The balls seem to glow and fade in and out as they move through the trees. They never make any sound and have been seen in both the swampy areas around the camp as well as more in the hardwoods. I do not believe they are any kind of gas. I think this is bullshit, if I can be frank. My wife is laughing now, and so for this story, I will be frank, both in what I tell you and my name. I work with the English, and this is what my good friend Eric always says, to be frank, I tell you. I believe the French do not say this, at least not in my family. 
So we have had things that I mentioned above happen and more around our camp. My wife has seen a tall dark figure standing at the clearing behind our ponds on more than one occasion. We are very remote and we do not feel this is a neighbor as we do not have closer neighbors than 30 kilometers. We get the odd bit of traffic passed through and these are either hunters or people camping or fishing out in the woods. But it would be very strange for someone over seven feet tall to be coming around repeatedly when there, there are no guests or vehicles at the camp at this time. I believe, believe again we have Bigfoot here on our property. How are you guys doing in the comments there? <laughs> I see we're talking about Windigos. Yeah, I don't ever want to run into that. Hey, we're over 50. Thanks guys. We're, we're in the middle of the story. Hang in there. We are quite a ways north of you, Gary, and we want to tell you very much that we agree with the idea of Bigfoot as a creature that migrates. We have activity here every fall and then very little strangeness during the winter. We have had a fishing guide report to us a set of tracks in the winter once. But the video he showed me on his phone looked like moose tracks as they often walk together and then the tracks get filled with snow and take on a new life of their own. I am not fooled. Here in the summer we also have lots of activity. But I will stand by the fact that some summers we see nothing. But every fall we hear screams, find new stick structures and hear tree knocks. Around here it is just normal to hear all of this in the woods. I have to say it's normal around here to hear that stuff as well, guys. We've recorded it so many times. I'm not saying it's Bigfoot, but I'm saying it's, it's happening out here. As you guys know, something's going on out here. The main story I want to share with you is from a time when I was much younger. I had met a few friends online back when computers and group chatting was new and exciting. I was in school in Montreal and had met a few guys from around the country who were avid kayakers. It was my passion back in those days. I had spent every break from school and many weeks each summer exploring new rapids and kayak routes and testing and challenging myself. I guess you could say I was a bit of an adrenaline junkie. I didn't know such a thing existed back then, but I was one. I have jumped out of a dozen planes, tried free base jumping and even a wingsuit. I like it all, fast cars and motorcycles. My wife says I'm not allowed to say fast women. Anyway, I met my friend Eric online and it just so happened that he was going to school in Quebec City and we met up a few times and did a couple of expeditions. We became very good friends and kayaking partners. We used to camp, explore and kayak the country together. Many years after school, we had planned a trip together to explore the watershed along the Quebec-Ontario border. Native tribes have always referred to this watershed as the Three Sisters and the locals told us about a gorge that was almost 10 kilometers long which had a very tough stretch of river with more than a half dozen rapids ranging from class two to five. Of course, as is always the case of such places, it is referred to by locals as Le Canyon du Diable, the Devil's Canyon. We've talked about this before, guys. There are a lot of places that get this name to do with the devil, right? It's always somewhere haunted where people have died or gone missing. You know, Mission 411 talks about this as well. So French culture, same thing. You won't find it called this on any map, and we will leave it at that. I believe the locals know better, and their name for this place is much more fitting than anything you will find on paper. Eric and I looked at the north end of the watershed and meticulously planned a three-day trip, which would consist of over 60 kilometers of river travel. Nothing very challenging for the first two days. One set of class three rapids. Everything else was just going to be a warm up for the final day, which we would see, which would see us hit the Canyon de Diable and the final 10 kilometers was very challenging rapids and falls. The first two days on the river passed without any problems. We were having fun and there was nothing too challenging about the top of the river system. It was in fact fast, fun and easy. This is maybe how I ended up getting into trouble on the third day as we hit the entrance to the Devil's Canyon. We wandered, we wondered at the beauty of the 30 meter high walls. We had a local native guide with us. See, you get all the reading mistakes. <laughs> we had a local native guide with us. He was young and had kind of become more than a friend than a guide over the last few weeks as he had helped us plan the trip and showed us all of the areas on the maps we would need to worry about. His name was Connor and it was his job to show us the cleanest routes through each section. We would always stop and look at a section 
discuss it, make a plan, and then Connor would go and execute the route. He had grown up on the river and he, his knowledge of rocks and currents here was invaluable. There goes the tent again. I'm gonna, we're gonna lose this tent, I know it. This pattern of running a rapid, stopping in the, at the next and making our plan and then executing was working very well until we came to one section, which was a class five set of rapids, which ended up with, in two sets of falls. Two falls in a row with only a small 50 meter stretch between them. It was a good 20 meter drop off the second falls. Connor recommended that we actually portage this set of rapids. Eric reluctantly agreed. I was not going to let that happen. I may have known, I may have thrown a little bit of a temper tantrum, exclaiming that this was the sole reason we were here. This set of class five was the best part. Connor was concerned that the water levels were a little low for his liking. Still high enough, but very dangerous. Of course it was dangerous. It was class five. Well, being the hard ass I was at 25, I was not going to give in. We walked the bank of the river for over an hour and planned a route. Eric and Connor were going to Portage and they would set up Eric at the halfway point, Connor at the bottom of the run, in case I got into any trouble. I started down the chute and I will tell you it was exhilarating. I ran the top 400 meters of rapids with little trouble. Trouble found me when I went over the first falls, which was only a four meter drop. I was not expecting any problems here until I plunged into the deep pool a little off center and came down on a rock. The right side of the kayak smacked hard and I slid forearm first into a boulder under the falls. My arm snapped immediately above my wrist. I cannot tell you what happened next as I surfaced the pain was excruciating. I kept my paddle and somehow went straight for shore. Eric caught me and helped steady me on the side of the river. I almost passed out. Looking back, it was one of those instances where youth, adrenaline and a lack of fear led to a bad outcome. I believe I was very lucky to have not killed myself that day. We had to stop. There was no going on. Emergency medical procedures began, a splint and some painkillers. We didn't have much else in the way of supplies. We decided there was no way out of this other than to call for help. I could not continue down the river with a broken arm. I could not walk out as it was just going to be too dangerous. Connor had an emergency phone. Back then, nobody had cell phones. We pulled all of our gear off the bank of the river below the bottom falls. Here we tried calling for help. We got no response on the radio. It seemed to have power but was not transmitting or receiving or just not working. We didn't know. Connor and Eric made the decision for Connor to run the rest of the gorge as he had plenty of daylight to make the seven kilometers to the bottom without so much as a see you later, he was gone. You guys still hanging in there? I will read all of your comments after the fact. If YouTube hasn't taken that away from me, I will. <laughs> you guys just chat amongst yourselves. We're halfway through. <laughs> Eric and I walked down river for about a quarter mile until we came to an area where the walls of the gorge almost disappeared. Coming in from the right side was a little tributary. We could both see from the river's edge this was a swamp drainage. It was almost dry but was emptying into the canyon. Eric told me to wait there while he went to check it out. I don't know how long I was there by myself but it felt like hours. The pain was excruciating and I was drifting in and out of reality. The sound of the water was helping me meditate. Lying on the shore beside my kayak at one point I opened my eyes and I saw what I thought was Eric. It didn't make sense to me as he was on the opposite side of the river on top of the wall of the gorge. What was he doing up there? I saw him very clearly standing up there looking down at me and the kayak. I must have entered the trance again as the next conscious thing I remembered was Eric gently waking me and looking at my eyes, checking for concussions again. I asked him what he saw up there on the gorge. He replied, you mean the swamp? I went up to the swamp and good news, we can get the chopper to come in right there. I have set up a bonfire to signal them that is where we we're going to go. I told him, no, I meant up there, and I pointed across the river. Eric said not to worry about it, I'd be okay. I was insistent, and he gently told me he had not crossed the river. When I realized he was right, he would have had to cross the river, I decided that maybe I had hit my head and had just imagined him standing there. Eric got me up and moving, and we traveled up the little creek a couple hundred meters into a dry swamp. This is where things started to get bad. The sky was no longer clear, and a large storm was moving in fast. The day had been sunny up until my accident. The storm, it seems, had come up from nowhere. Eric put me under a large spruce at the edge of the swamp. Again, he had to leave me and go back to the kayaks for packs and gear. When he was gone, I know I was fully awake and aware. Yes, my arm hurt, but I know what I saw. Across the swamp, as Eric disappeared back down the gorge, I saw two figures walking on two legs across the back of the swamp. One was large, the other 
smaller and following like an adult and child. They were not human, they were dark in color with no clothes, very tall, and disappeared in a matter of seconds. When Eric returned, I was there quietly watching the back swamp. I told him someone was there, two someones. He looked at me with a concern, but he told me it was okay. He had grabbed a tarp from the kayak and put it over the signal fire. It was already starting to rain. The storm began in earnest. We hid under that spruce tree and did our best to stay dry. The wind was blowing like crazy and the rain was driving. It did not stop. It went on for hours. Eric and I huddled under the insulating sheet for warmth. We did not even attempt to light a fire. It was too wet. As full on darkness arrived, we knew no help was coming that night. And again, guys, I'll just mention, you know, in uh, the 411 books, David Polite's books, he talks about this all the time, right? When guys have accidents, get stranded up on the mountain or wherever, it seems that these weird storms roll in and rescue is either hindered, stopped, or delayed. And here's a count from a guy right here in Canada saying the exact same thing happened to him. Is it just coincidence? I don't know. The only dry wood was under the tarp for the signal fire and Eric rightly refused to light it. The storm was letting up a little. The winds were still high, but eventually the rain stopped. I know that was the worst night of my life in terms of sleep. I may even have started to fever. Eric watched over me and at one point I awoke to hear screaming. A woman. I could not figure out where I was and who was screaming. The look on Eric's face was one of terror. I passed out again. This went on all night, making with me waking every so often. I was not sure what was a dream and what wasn't. Just before dawn, I woke to hear Eric yelling. He was screaming at the woods with his back to me, obscenities in English and French. I called for him and he stopped, turning to me. His eyes were red and he looked exhausted. I could tell he hadn't slept. I asked him what was going on. He came back to the spruce and knelt beside me. If help is not here within an hour of daylight, he told me we were going to have to move. I asked him what he meant and he told me there was some animal stalking the camp all night. It had screamed at us and Eric had heard it breaking sticks and huffing. He said he wasn't sure what it was, but it wasn't a bear. I don't remember much from that morning, only that as the pre-dawn sky lightened in the east, we both heard the womp 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 of the search and rescue chopper. Eric lit the fire and they were on us within minutes. They did actually land right there in the open swamp. I was airlifted out and treated for my arm and scrapes and bruises. I spent two days in the hospital before they let me go. Eric and I did not talk about that trip or the strange things happening for about five years. It just never came up. Then one night while sitting around the fire at our hunt camp, I asked Eric about that trip. Eric confirmed he had never gotten a good look at the creature that was stalking us, but he had seen something dark and large moving just out of sight at the edge of the swamp. It had even thrown sticks and pine cones all around where I was lying. Eric said it had screamed three times that night, each time like a woman in distress, loud, forceful, and wailing. I have since told him what I saw on both the ridge of the gorge and at the back of the swamp. We both agree I did not have a concussion and probably did see what I thought I had seen. That was my first encounter with Bigfoot and when you put an X on the map as to where all of this happened and the local natives refer to the place as the Devil's Canyon, we are left with little doubt as to what they are referring to. Since that trip, as I say, many things around camp have solidified not only mine and Eric's belief that these creatures exist, but my wife Elaine as well. All three of us are believers. These things exist and they are wild people, men of the woods, not to be messed with, something ancient, a throwback to modern man, bigger, stronger, faster, and much more attuned with nature. I will send you a private message with my contact information, and if you would ever like to come and hunt in Quebec for moose or Bigfoot, I can set you up. Keep up the great work on the channel. Looking forward to you getting one on video. Frank and Elaine. So there we go, guys. Another cool story I thought I would share. Um, also, I want to get back to life is a flyway. He sent me a four-page encounter that happened on his channel. He was live one night recording, and they saw orbs. And he sent me four pages. And then I thought he wanted me to share it, but I contacted him just to make sure. And he said, no, hang on to it. So I want you guys comment, you know, let's get life is flyway, uh, you know, Share the story, man. Be comfortable. You're not crazy. I see the same things here. We've recorded them here. So I just think everybody should share their encounters.